The Libertarian State Leadership Alliance presents our 2017 National Conference, The Future of the Libertarian Political Movement. In this video, End the Surveillance State with Larry Sharp, Angela Keaton, and George Phillies. In any event, I'm George Phillies, and this is the panel on End the Surveillance State. And I have with me two panelists, Angela Keaton and Larry Sharp. So I will let them introduce themselves first. First, Angela. I'm Angela. I'm with antiwar.com, and I don't like killing people. I'm Larry Sharp, and I also don't like killing people. And on top of that, I don't like paying people to kill people, or authorizing people to kill people, or paying taxes to kill people, or any of those things. I would rather not kill people. But more importantly, this is going to sound crazy, the people who die, their pain and suffering is over. I'm actually more concerned about people that we punish and imprison and surveil and ruin their lives and stop them from traveling and break their families up and imprison them, actually even more because their suffering continues. And I'm George Phillies, and I have been editor of Liberty for America, and I have been state chair of my party, and I am currently national chair of the Libertarian State Leadership Association the state chairs part club. Having said that, what is the surveillance state? And I'll give two examples. One goes back over a decade. This fellow who worked at AT&T pointed out that the federal government had gone into all of the major AT&T switching centers. This is also true for most of the other phone providers. Phone signals these days are sent as light signals, not as electrical signals and copper wire. They dropped what is known as a beam splitter. This is just a slightly reflecting mirror into the light beam. And so most of the light went through. So your phone calls went through. And some of it went this way. And the government was recording all of the phone calls in the United States. <clears throat> and people sort of ignored that until we advanced to the future. And we reach Edward Snowden. Mr. Snowden, of course, is the country, is the greatest living American patriot. He gave up everything to protect our country. And with some luck, he will eventually have succeeded. And what he pointed out was the federal government was recording all of our phone calls, all of our internet messages, all of our credit card transactions, all of our bank transactions. Uh, and they were also picking up all of the social media messages, <clears throat> you know, Facebook and all that other good stuff. Uh, the um, Facebook and friends all said, oh no, the government does not have physical access to our servers. Well, that was literally true. The government had no particular interest in fondling steel boxes. They didn't want physical access to the servers. They want, simply wanted a copy of all of the messages which they were getting. That's the surveillance state. So we can discuss various ways the surveillance state is bad. It's a little different than the warfare state, which is concerned with going to strange foreign countries, meeting interesting foreign people, and blowing them to smithereens. But this one is concerned with going to America and treating us as if we were residents of oh, communist, some communist or Nazi country, although the truth of the matter is those other places had spy operations, inter domestic ones, that were a complete bunch of amateurs by comparison with our American spy agencies. Angela. I always like to open with a quote. Um, this is from Arthur Silver and the Power of Narrative blog. And if you haven't, if you're not familiar with this blog, it's one of the best anti-imperialist, some of the best anti-imperialist writing I've ever read on the net. And he said, the state has no secrets whatsoever that deserve protection from disclosure. None. The state doesn't have the right to privacy. We do as individuals. And it's not just an assault on what we think of as civil liberties, but the very essence of being an adult is to have privacy and to have boundaries. We talk about the psycho battle concept of having boundaries. It's impossible to have normal, healthy psychological boundaries under a surveillance state. I can talk a little bit more about this when I talk about the antiwar.com's case against uh, the FBI. I want to bring up a, a specific situation. The surveillance state does something very well, is it makes all of us guilty of something. So what, what it means is people often think, well, look, if you have nothing to hide, what are you worried about? The problem is we all have something to hide. There's 
thousands and thousands of laws, and I'm sure all of us have broken at least once. So once they target you, you go away. And when the worst part about surveillance is they have all the data, you don't. So what are they going to show a jury when they want to put you in jail? What are they going to show a grand jury if they decide they're going to indict you or not? They're going to take lines of what you said, black out all context, and just put the bad words there. And when they put the bad words there, what does the jury say? Yes, we should convict him. Yes, guilty. How do I know that? I've been on actual, working on teams, that I've seen the government actually do that. Literally take the, the lines of whatever they took from someone's surveillance, black out everything that would have made any context whatsoever, just show the scary words, guilty. That happens all the time. We think we don't care. Well, what happens when it's you? What happens when the government decides you're a bad guy or a bad gal for some reason? All the surveillance they have, they will cherry pick what they think is bad. They will show that to whoever they're gonna decide is gonna put you away, or put you on a list, or stop you from buying a gun, or stop you from flying, or put you in jail, or take away your home, or take away your children, or whatever is the next step. The surveillance step state allows that to happen. So when you get targeted, you are guilty. For when you're targeted, your peers will take away your property, your life, your liberty, and your family. What is the, prop, the most dangerous thing the surveillance state has done, though? There is a meme, and it, it, I'm quite sure it was originally generated someplace in Langley or wherever, and now it's being put out by fellow travelers and useful idiots and stooges. And the line is, why should I care? I'm not doing anything wrong. Well, there's another piece to that beyond what Larry mentioned, and the piece to that is, uh, well, you may think you're, you're not doing anything wrong, but let's consider a few examples here. You're up for promotion at a job. Your competitor is Clement Doofus, who has managed not to get himself fired. Unfortunately, there's a little difficulty. The surveillance state has a good 100 or 200,000 employees. You count all of their immediate relatives, parents, children, and such not, we're up to one or two million. You count all of their close friends who know someone is on in one of these groups and we're now up to 10 or 20 million and they see if they can get a favor done and you're up against clement doofus who was a complete incompetent except the guy making the decision had a motivational phone call he'll promote clement doofus and the uh, <clears throat> his phone mysteriously turned on unfortunately it mysteriously turned on in the motel room where he was having the affair with the hot babe in accounting. And it, the it, photographs will not turn up on his phone, they will turn up in his wife's phone, so he'd like to promote climate. And then, of course, there are people like me. How many of us here are in the investor class? Wave if we're investors at all. Yes. Well, consider you t test yourself against Warren Buffett, and you're not quite as good, but almost. Except when you go to invest mysteriously, the stuff you were going to invest in, the prices drifted up well before you invested. And when time comes to sell, the price has gone down again because people were selling. And the reason is we have the surveillance state, and it's the world's greatest source of inside information. You don't have to wonder what Warren Buffett is going to buy. You can listen to his phone calls with his advisors and know the truth. Now, to a certain extent, the surveillance state has actually been honest about this. Namely, they have a special investigatory team which checks up on people who are using the vast surveillance state to see if their wives were cheating on them, or their girlfriends have other boyfriends, or vice versa, or whatever. You see what's going on? And the last bit, of course, is some of you will have children. And the children sometimes do things they shouldn't. And they have cell phones where they are stupid enough to photograph themselves, but it goes up encrypted onto the cloud. That's the encryption that was written in Langley. And suddenly you get this phone call. Here is what your kid was doing. And it was very bad. And we have this list of other things, some of which you didn't know about. We'll make you a deal. You'll put the kid in this very expensive military school, which happens to be run by a really good two-star general. He was really good. Namely, he was a great friend of the agency for many years, and in return, we'll make everything disappear. 
That's what the surveillance state means. It doesn't have to be smart on, you don't have to be doing anything wrong. It's still your enemy. We'll come to fake cases and sod rhymes with General Zod in a bit. But now, Larry, I think, is next. Oh, my next? Yes. I'm next. There we go. I didn't know who was next. It's me. All right, the other thing that I'm concerned about here when it comes to surveillance state is that it basically says it's okay for people to be prosecuted for thought crimes. And that becomes my issue. There has been no victim. Nothing's been done. It's an excuse to prosecute people for thought crimes. It puts you on, the surveillance state isn't just looking at you through you know, a telescope or, or listening to your phone calls. It's also the idea of people physically following you, right? Physically following you around, you being on a list. The list thing scares me tremendously because if I'm a bureaucrat, I'm a bureaucrat now, I'm in charge of putting people on a list. And list is people who might be bad and do something wrong. And Daryl Perry might be, maybe should be on that list or not. I'm not sure, well, I know he should be, but I'm saying the general rule, should he be on that list or not? I'm a bureaucrat. I'm not sure. Where do I err? Always. He's on that list. Of course I put him on that list. I don't think twice. Why? Because if he does something wrong, my job is now in jeopardy. I'm the one who gets fired. So of course I'm putting him on that list. If there's any chance he comes near me, he's on that list. So now once he's on that list, he says, no, I should be on that list. I go, yeah, I can't really talk to you. Why? Well, you're on the list. Yeah. So I can't talk to him. There's no way to get him off the list because he's on the list. He's now a bad guy. So we're putting tons of people on these lists just because we are. We're stopping people from traveling, stopping people from buying weapons. We're stopping people from having lives based upon, well, they might be a bad guy. And this is the biggest problem. This all comes from the war on terror, the war on drugs, the war on something. Once there's a war on something, I can do whatever I can to protect the people. And what they always talk about, I have to have surveillance, I have to have lists, because I have to save people. Here's the thing that I want to be clear on. Every single executive since 9-11 has said, my number one job is protecting the American people. Nowhere in their oath was that. I know, I'm a veteran, I took the same oath. The oath is to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's what the oath is. It's not to protect every single American. That's not what we're supposed to do. Not what anyone's supposed to do. In our perfect world, in our imaginary world where it's supposed to be, the, the government actually, or the people, the president, actually protects the Constitution. The Constitution protects, protects our rights so we can protect ourselves. That's how it's supposed to happen. But we've decided to lose our rights, and we lose our rights always for the same reason. It's the same reason every time, fear. The more we are afraid, the more rights we will lose. The more we are afraid, the more we will begin to lose and put ourselves in a cage. Remember, we allow this to happen, right? So we're allowing the government to put us into a cage because we're afraid. Bad guys, I work for them. Um, in 2011, we learned that antiwar.com had been under some kind of surveillance since roughly 2002. There was a long series of events, and only recently, and I mean by recently, I mean by last month, has part of the case been resolved. The ACLU, um, to their credit, spent several, I mean, it, it spent significant amount of money fighting on behalf of the, the original founders of antiwar.com to not be surveyed and to have all their records of the FBI collected on them re released. Uh, after several years, Part of that case is one, antiwar.com according, well, the ruling was that all the records were supposed to be released and that the surveillance would stop and almost $300,000 goes to pay some of the legal fees because all, most of ACLU work, most of the work the ACLU does is pro bono. Most of these people work for major corporations and then they do this pro bono work in their time. This is a real thing. And we all joke about being under surveillance and under, you know, thanks to Snowden, we know that we're all under surveillance. But being specifically targeted makes you think very diff differently about the world and feel differently about the world. And paranoia, which is a normal and creative reaction to actual oppression, becomes part of the way you think about think about your things. So you can't be rational. Yeah. You can't feel safe in your own thoughts. We were talking about thought crimes. That's the one place that, my God, you think you might own. And when you can't express yourself in the most basic ways, or you are writing your basic journal, I mean. The, 
we talk a good game about the Constitution. I love the First Amendment. All those things that it stands for are beautiful, wonderful things. But when journalism is considered a thought crime, or is an actual crime, or it's considered propaganda, we're seeing a lot of that now with this, this artificial debate on fake news versus real news, and who's credible and who isn't, and some really blatant propaganda. This now reinforces all the things, that, I mean, basically, there is no going to be no diversity of thought beyond the old school, like Noam Chomsky used to talk about manufacturing consent. And we think about the old leftist ways of looking at the media as kind of old school, but now as libertarians we realize that's all correct. Yes, there's a manufacturing of consent. There's a very limited range of topics we're allowed to speak about. And when you live under a surveillance state, you become much more self-critical, self-censoring. I know I've changed my behavior in light of Anti, we learned about antiwar.com being spied upon. Now I have no idea if the government has any interest in me. I've been doing this kind of radicalism since I was a kid. I went to my first protest when I was nine with my old man. But the idea that you can be, the idea that your most intimate conversations are being recorded, things about your family, things that women discuss that are different from, that, as, that are specific to women that they discuss in private, all these things that feel, feel horribly violated, and it changes behavior, and it's deliberate to make us more cautious, make us more afraid. And I don't want to live in fear constantly. I don't like what it does to me psychologically. I don't like what it's doing to journalism, and I don't like what it's doing to the American people. Uh, sometime in the last few months, Mr. Trump, among his many other claims, claimed that he was being spied on by Obama, and he was ridiculed. Everyone in the United States is being spied on. Why do we think, Mr. why should anyone think that Mr. Trump was any different? But I'm going to take two other perspectives on this. And one is, I mentioned Snowden, and Mr. Snowden fled to Russia finally. And then we had a bunch of establishment sorts like Dianne Feinstein and then the Speaker of the House Boner. And what they all said was, gee, Snowden is a traitor. Well, there's an interesting point here, since after all, these are very senior people who should know what treason is of the United States. Yes. So is he um, levying war on the United States? Not that we can tell. He was entitled to the data. No, he must be assisting an enemy. Well, who was the enemy? Was it Russia or China or North Korea? They all have spies in the US. It is inconceivable if you're a Russian or Chinese or North Korean spy that it was not explained to you in great and painful detail that all of your phone calls were being tapped. And therefore, everyone who was one of those spies knew about it. No, who, who did not know they were being spied on? Who were the enemies of the United States? After all, he was ass assisting enemies of the United States. Who are those enemies who didn't know what was going on? Angela. One, two, three, <laughs> us. Yes, the enemies of the establishment are the American people. I'm going to take a slightly different perspective on that. This goes back to when I was running for our presidential nomination two cycles ago. And I made a comment. First of all, electronic warfare is warfare. If you don't believe me, look up how much the Army and Navy and Air Force spend on it for legitimate electronic. Well, I agree you may not approve of war, though electronic warfare doesn't really hurt a lot of people. It's warfare. And what is the United States? Is it a beautifully colored piece of cloth? Is it a piece of hemp paper with some interesting handwriting on it? No, the United States is the American people. And the electronic warfare of the surveillance state was warfare. It was being waged on the United States. Well, that's one of the three crimes enumerated in the Constitution. It's called treason. And who are the traitors? It's the head of the NSA and the head of the CIA and the National Intelligence Director and a whole pile of other people who were involved in this, like 50 or 100,000 of them. They're all traitors to the United States. They're waging war on America. And as a libertarian who believes in enforcing reasonable laws where people are being injured, like all of us losing our privacy, I am firmly in favor of trying all of them. Now, I got the comment, well, you can't try 50,000 people. 
Oh, yeah? How many drug criminals do you think we have in prison at the moment? It's about 1.5 million. And after we let all of them out as good libertarians, there will be loads of space for all of those <clears throat> folks to be spending the rest of their lives. You see, we're even going to give employment to otherwise unemployable prison guards. We're nice people. Yes, there's only one word that is needed to describe the surveillance state. Treason. Damn, I feel good. That's kind of invigorating, actually, what you just said. The um, root causes of the surveillance state, or at least the excuse, is always we lose our civil liberties every time we expand the empire. And the police state is just empire. It's just the police state is empire's worldwide police state. And we bring the empire back home. We're doing that with our police departments now, with bringing in blatant militarization and the mindset of, of, vet of veterans who may be coming in with PTSD or conditioned to think certain ways that are not entirely helpful uh, to, peace, to peacefulness. Because the excuse, people will rationalize, well, the old school way is like, oh, I have nothing to hide. But the new rationalization is, we have all these terrorists. Well, why do we have all these terrorists? Because of our behavior abroad. Because of our behavior abroad, we have more, there's more violence. The more violence is now the excuse to, have, to further curtail our civil liberties. And it keeps, it's an endless cycle that's going to keep spiraling downward. I don't know how to get people out of the mindset because I think psychologically, and this may be a generational issue, because of social networking and because of therapy culture, because people are now prone to overshare everything, the idea of personal privacy is a little different. Yeah. And it's something we have to really fight and struggle for because people don't respect that and nor person to person. I do think our culture kind of encourages us not to be. And without privacy, you're not an individual. So I like to go to the root causes and say, what do we do specifically to end their surveillance state? And one of the things they do is there's a list of bills coming up in kind of the house that they're being introduced by different people that specifically go to ending war in the Middle East that will be the continued excuse for us losing whatever liberties we have left. I want to strike the root <coughs> and I want to do specific activism. I know I'm the biggest complainer in the movement about abstract things, but there are lists of things we can do that are actual activism that we can fund that we can organize for, and then we can have an actual metric on. For example, Tulsi Gabbard's bill, uh, and occasionally Rand Paul introduces bills that are actually really good. It happens, not often, but not often enough, but it does happen. And there's a list that we can consult on in a little bit, but I want to strike the root causes. I want to stop giving people the excuse for the constant surveillance. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great point, and it, there are two wars we have to end, and it's the war on terror and the war on drugs. If we can end those two wars, I think that will get most Americans to start thinking, why are we doing this surveillance thing? But if we don't end them early enough, soon enough, we're just going to be in the habit, as you said, of not having privacy. I think that will become a habit. It'll become part of our culture, that privacy will be seen as something that's silly. You can't have privacy. Why can you do that? I hear people today talk about it that way. Like, why are you worried about it? You know, whatever you, whatever you, you know, do is on Facebook anyway. I, I actually hear people kind of joke about privacy as, right to your point, as who cares? It's not valuable. Look, you can't have privacy anyway, so just put your stuff on Twitter and Facebook and who cares? So they listen to your phone calls. You're going to put it out anyway. It doesn't matter. There's almost a, a, a wave of youth that is thinking it doesn't matter anymore. So if we don't end these soon, second? Because they've been taught it. That's correct. Yes. They've grown up with it. They've taught it. They believe it. Yes. I can come into your locker. I can check your book bag. I want you to stand against that. Absolutely. It, yes, it, and, and it, 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 well, there was a there was a white privileged point in time where this only happened to black kids in That's New York City, but now it's essentially yes. You hop out of your BMW SUV, wave goodbye to mom, and get searched. Yes, and let me check your bag. Every every baby, I was at a Mets game uh, the other day, other day, and they, they check your bag before you come in. They do a metal detector before you go in. Baseball games are now that way. You check this, pull you aside, one check check you up and down, everyone in person. So privacy is, is really, at two points, right in the money. It's going away as the norm. Soon it will be the odd thing, like why would you want that? And soon asking for privacy, just asking for it, will be the admission of guilt. Stasi. That's correct. Oh, why do you want privacy? What are you hiding? Why do you want privacy? You must be a criminal. So eventually that's going to happen. So we have to end those two wars right away. If we can end the war on drugs and end the war on terror, many Americans will stop thinking that it's valuable because now as soon as the terrorist attack, you see it, 
There was a terrorist attack in, in England, right? Recently in Manchester, right? Not this Manchester. Right? Yeah, there, was a there was a terrorist attack in, in, in Manchester in England, right? With 22 people, is that right? It was 29. 29 people died, 20 people Horrible, terrible. It's terrible. More people committed suicide in America that day. In an hour. Not an hour, in a day. More people in, about 100 or so people a day committed suicide in America, give or take. So more people committed suicide in America that day than 20 people who died. But do we hear about that? No, not at all. Instead, we hear the world's ending, more safety. The world's ending, more safety. The first thing that happens in New York City, where I live, is now you see the cops out with the M16s and the AR-15s in the train stations now. And they're checking your bags. That's what happens because of an attack in Manchester that kills 29 people. And, and do you see a, a New Yorkers fight that? Not at all. We have accepted that as the norm. We've accepted that as completely okay. No one fights that anymore. No one even cares. And that's one of my bigger issues, my bigger worries. Thank you for that. Arvin made the point about generating evidence in which you black out all of the words until you get the answer you want. Uh, and that works. But it's the old-fashioned primitive approach. The modern approach, thanks to the intelligence agencies, is the Special Operations Directorate. The Special Operations Directorate takes all of this stuff they're listening to, <coughs> and they look for people doing things that actually are illegal, like loading marijuana into their cars. And they have arrangements, because the SOD includes the DEA and the BATF and a whole bunch of local police agencies, and they send an anonymous tip, except it's coded so the police know what they're getting, to the local police agencies. And then the local police agencies do one, two things. First, they take advantage of the tip to catch the drug smuggler. And then they know they have to explain how they knew this and could do it as a legal search. So they generate a completely fake trail of evidence. It's called parallel construction. The completely fake trail has to be hidden from the judges and the prosecutors, and it actually is. And since the trail is completely fake, it contains no weaknesses. There's no danger that another copy of that mess email message will show up without the words blacked out. There's no danger of anything going wrong. That's the Special Operations Directorate. Uh, the other question we can ask is, what else can you do about this? Well, I did something about it a few years ago. It turns out, at the time, for about 1900 bucks, you could rent an ad in a Washington, D.C. subway station for a month. Three by five foot illuminated. I rented one in the McPherson station, which is where the FBI agents and a bunch of other such not and White House folks get up. And the big sign said, impeach them both. And it was a picture of Clapper and a picture of the then NSI director. And the message was, here are the things they did wrong. I did not use the T word. I did say they lied to Congress. That was well known. And I did say they had been levying electronic warfare on the United States, and there were two witnesses. And believe me, in that crew, they knew what I was saying. And this is called public shaming. It actually works. So that is the message on how the other way you can oppose these things. That is, you call people out who are doing it, and you do it in a very public way, so they know they are doing it, they know they are being publicly shamed. Angela. No, I guess it should be Art. I'm sorry. I'm Larry, but that's okay. Larry, never mind. <laughs> no worries. I'm doing really well today, aren't I? Nice. I love Arvin too. Oh, good. Life is good. All right, so um, actually, I'd like to take some more questions, if that's okay. Can we, do, can we take we questions? We can certainly take questions. Yes, please. Yeah, please. All right, so I've got well, a, uh, uh, like uh, a two-part <laughs> right. question, if possible. Um, first, on the supposed uh, intelligence, and I'm using that term very loosely, of Russian interference in the election, uh, I actually looked at the FBI's report, and one of the claims was that RT America's broadcast of presidential debates hosting Libertarian and Green Party presidential candidates was proof of Russian interference in the elections. Uh, so do you think that that would then lead me and by um, 
extension everybody here to be surveilled because we know that the way Prism, they would not only tar or go after the target, but everybody communicating with the target, and then everybody communicating with somebody communicating with the target. And the second part of the question is the anti-war uh, surveillance where they were being surveilled by the FBI. Do you also think that they would be looking at the donors and then the people communicating with the donors? Well, I'll talk to first, touch the first part. The first part, I think no. And I think no because we're not a threat yet. As a general rule, and I did a little bit of intel when I was in the Marine Corps, as a general rule, you just keep it out there. You don't touch the target unless it becomes a hot target, right? This is an issue. You think something's going to happen. So until they think that we're a threat, I think you just keep that in the pocket. I think they ignore us almost completely. And then if they see us as a threat, then they bring it out. Remember, the goal is to make it so that everyone can be, everyone's guilty of something, so that when I target you, I can put you in jail. So I don't think they're doing that now at all. So like the trial by Kafka? Yes, yes, what, oh, oh now, oh, you're, you're, you're an issue now. Okay, now we're gonna look back, bring all this stuff up, and now we're gonna put you in. But I think now they're ignoring us right now. I don't think they care right now, we're not really a threat. If it became a threat, I think they would then bring it up. It's just, it's use of resources. Daryl, the, uh, well, you know, this, the anti-war movement, the whole movement, I'm not speaking just specifically about the Libertarian Peace Camp, has been under surveillance since World War I. It's actually very normal. That it, there's nothing really particularly freaky or outlying about what happened to antiwar.com under this. That's normal. The government has a reason to survey anti-war efforts. And as recently as 2010, there were anti-war activists in Minnesota who were, who were, whose homes were raided. A lot of them were involved more specifically with a justice for Palestinians and other more specific causes within the anti-war movement, but this is not at all unusual. Um, the ant war is the biggest thing the state does, and it's the most important thing if you think about it that way. So naturally, they're going to take the, the surveillance state is going to take an interest in what the anti what, what the anti-war movement does and says. Um, I was thinking back though, there are different points in history where any of this probably could have been stopped. And one of the, the most recent was one, one of the ones that really kind of kicked off my adult life because we all need money to survive an investment. But does 1999 bankers came up with Know Your Customer, yeah. where the regulations mm -hmm. and observation of everything in your bank account and how you transact with money becomes part of what the state is allowed to know. And even right. kind of under normal Anglo-American middle class bourgeois standards, it was kind of understood that your bank account and your bedroom were kind of off limits, right. even though they never really have been. But 1999, it's almost been 20 years, where every aspect of your banking, which is a form of expression, one of the ways, of course, we get around that, we've all talked this one to death, but is digital currency. In other words, so we can be able to survive and try to invest outside the system, but that's you know, I mean, these are all things that are somewhat risky. Right. We still do, con we kind of need conventional investments to survive. And that's not Austrian theory, but we're talking about day-to-day -day survival. But I think that was maybe one of the last points that we should have fought against harder to stop this. Because once everyone knows, I mean, you can tell everything someone does and who they are by their credit card statements. Well, also with Glass-Steagall being uh, removed, mm -hmm. right? Because now investments and banking go together, and now they want to make sure they get all the transactions with you, so <laughs> there was a, a banking issue behind that. Sure. So we've got you know, 18 years of a lack of boundaries. Let me take a slightly different perspective on that, since I will disagree with Larry. Uh, you remember we said that every email and phone call in the country is being grabbed. And the phone calls are then digitized and voice to text, so they're searchable and small. Well, oh, that's nice. Now what happens to it? Well, the answer is the government went to Utah, and they built a computer memory object. And the computer memory object has a five yatta byte, roughly speaking, capacity. Now you might ask, well, who is yatta and what is the capacity? Uh, if you've got a big computer these days, it might say have five terabytes of disk drive. That's big data. Now imagine a million of them. That's a yada byte. They have a huge amount of memory capacity. And they also have a huge amount of computer capacity and clever software for searching it. So under modern conditions, instead of waiting until we decide, oh, X is a threat, we better start looking up data on it, they simply take X as everything. And so for example, there's everyone you interact with and speak to. It's a social connectivity graph. 
and there's everyone they speak to, and that's simply stored. And since you have computers which have huge capacities, you do all the analysis of everything, like the local uh, ladies' rose cutting club, because you never know when rose cutters will become dangerous subversives. And you just collect and analyze everything by computer, and when you decide you want it, it's already there. Uh, that's what the government does. Uh, the other thing, of course, is the government is perfectly, the executive of government is perfectly happy to be asked by Congress or the judiciary what is going on. <clears throat> and this could occasionally be embarrassing because congressmen would rather not know or would rather not be the case that the CIA is, has records of all their phone calls with all of their mistresses or whatever. Well, they really would like that. So they ask the CIA director and the NSA director, well, are we recording any phone calls of Americans? And sometimes the answer is no. Are we recording bank transactions? No. Are we recording this? No. That. And the, if you look it up, the, the executive had a very simple solution to dealing with this. They simply had their spy agency top people lie through their teeth about what they were doing. <clears throat> and our worthless Congress didn't have the nerve to impeach the lot of them for perjury, which is what they should have done. And perhaps someday we will have some libertarian congressmen who will be sitting there filing articles of impeachment for perjury. That's always a good solution as a start. So. Is that the question that's that? Question. Yeah, what really always bothered me is that people don't care that they're being surveilled. And yes. This was, and I know, I know, especially for millennials, they're just, like I said, I don't know of a single high school that doesn't have a police officer yep. in it anymore. You know, you go through, it's like, you go to the airport, it's always, oh, what's your papers, what's your approval, and it's like, it's become this culture of, you know, that, that you said, no one, no one expects yes. any different. It's some cases, that if you're young enough, you don't know, but even people, you know, in their 30s and 40s who do remember when you didn't have all this, they don't seem to care. Like when, like I said, when the story about the, the NSA having, you know, duplicating all the data at at and switching offices, you tell people about that, and they're like, oh, that's bad. But they don't, the, the, the care level, yep. the, the, nothing's triggering it. You know, when you find out that even private agencies, that, you know, Google data mines everything you send to them. There's, a, there's actually a thing now that the psychologists are noticing, and, and it's been happening for about 10 years. It's teenagers acting like they're on a reality program when they're not. So they're assuming that they're always being viewed, that someone is always taking their picture, that someone is always recording them. So they're literally speaking as if there's a camera there. They're looking, and now I'm thinking so and so. Like they, like they think they're now in the, you know, the, the, the room. What's that, what's that called? The, the, the small room you go to when you. The green room? The confession room? No, the confession room. Thank you. They think they're in a confession room. And they're talking to their friend like they're in the confession room. And this is like a thing that's been happening for about 10 years, and it's getting worse. And now these people are now in their 20s and 30s now. And there's still people who think in their heads like they should be acting like they're always on stage, they're always being surveilled, and that their life should always be a popular thing. Of course, this cuts the other way. If you are the secret police and you want to intimidate people by threatening to reveal things, it works really poorly against people who assumed they were always being surveilled. <laughs> that's true. Um, I hope that's not our answer, though. So, so no, that is not a good answer, <laughs> yes. but it is an answer. There are variations on this racket, the surveillance state racket, um, where gee, this can blow up in people's faces. They wait until someone travels to a remote point. And then they put them on the uh, <clears throat> no-fly list and say, well, we'll take you off the no-fly list if you'll agree to be an informer. And this has been done on a fairly regular basis and has been called out. But the answer is, if you want to fix this, there are three boxes that will fix things. The soap box, the donation box, the ballot box. Yes. And if you want it fixed, you need candidates, especially top level, that's presidential, candidates who go after this as the national security state, the deep state, is completely disloyal to our country. It has to be cleaned up simply by firing vast numbers of people and trying them. And the people who are defending it in Congress and my presidential opponents are disloyal to our country. They're as disloyal as the commie atom bomb spies. There actually were a few of them back in the 40s. 
and you actually go after people in very firm terms, uh, and A, you might win, and B, you are moving the Overton window, because when you sit there saying advocates of the surveillance state are traitors, participants in the surveillance state should be tried, you're putting up a position which is not currently inside the Overton window, and that actually works. What I was, well, what I was going to say, this is just something I wanted to make sure that this doesn't get lost out there. There's a Carl Hess quote, the most radical thing you can do is get to know your neighbors. Learn to develop normal face-to-face -face relationships with people, like a normal human being, interact with people, invite people over, go to people's houses, go have potlucks, do things that aren't online. Yeah. That's... You want to protect, you take responsibility for protecting your privacy and your dignity, and you're in a movement full of people who understand encryption, who understand alternative finance, who can explain to you what things to use and what things might be more secure. Is it a safeguard against a giant security? No. But taking responsibility and taking action and respecting the idea of privacy is going to outlast, far outlast this empire. Because this will, the empire will collapse, it won't go on forever. And maybe no one in this room will see the end of it, but damn straight that we've made our contribution to ending the stupidity. Yeah, I think your point's again a valid one. The only thing I would say is we have to end this quickly because eventually the people who are now 16, 17, 21, 22, 23, they're eventually going to be in charge of the country. And if they all of a sudden think that privacy is silly and dumb and who needs it, that's going to be the end of privacy. At one point, they're going to be in charge. So there is as you, many of you heard me talk, I talk about a seven-year plan. We have to have a plan to get in charge to make some changes. If we don't do it soon, it will be too late. There is a point of no return to where the people who think it's okay are in charge, are the majority, they aren't going to change anything, and we're wasting our time. So that's my bigger, bigger concern is there is a time frame on this. Go ahead, Ruth. Go ahead. Angela was talking about Eugene Debs getting uh essentially persecuted and tried for treason for his anti-war activities back in the 19, well, back in the First World War. Younger folks remember Philip Berrigan and the uh, Vietnam War. Um, Angela also mentioned uh, the, the banking regulation of, of know your customer. That was in response to um, uh, Abdul Rahman, the blind cleric, and his band of Mary Misfits blowing up a van in the uh, World Trade Center. When that happened, uh, FBI agent Frank Amaro, a friend of mine, said, we just bombed the building. And I was like, which building is that? He said, the building I'm in. <clears throat> so he's down kicking bits of concrete down the hole the next morning, taking a look at it. And you know how the FBI solved the bombing? The guy that rented the van, who was actually essentially the village idiot, Named Nozair, um, went back to the rental agency and went, I don't have the van, but I'd like my $300 deposit back. <laughs> Wait right here. <laughs> yes. So, because of the Arab banking um, way of doing things, which is Daryl lends me money through Mr. DiStefano, um, but it's all done by handshake and no electronics, we really haven't dealt with the, the root cause of some of this. <coughs> But we did address the 1980s omissions by the passage of that act. That took roughly 10 years. If you remember the night of 9-11, I lost a good handful of friends in that building when it went down and all of them were firemen. When you looked at that TV, we went from early in the day to every talking head on every station had somebody in a seat, whether it was a dog catcher or a former general, saying, what are we going to do? The American people want to know, what are we going to do? It was a drumbeat for war, which Angela will tell you, and it was a drumbeat for this surveillance state that they had fought to establish for 10 years. And it needed a seminal event. How quick did the surveillance state pop up? Oh, good thing we built this thing. We can put it into effect tomorrow. We need a black budget, and we need to be able to say to a congressman that's above your pay grade. And what we haven't noticed, how many here work in IT? 
Okay. What's best practices? Have a backup of everything. Mm -hmm. So when I, as Larry Sharp, want to go in and I want to buy a firearm, I have a uh, national instant check system, mm -hmm. which is different than naval criminal uh, investigation, mm -hmm. but people move those figures around. When I have a firearm background check, the FBI, by definition in the law, is prohibited from keeping that record for more than three days. Who said that the NSA can't pull that little bit of data, stick it in a pocket? Because at no point has the surveillance state been told, you can't keep that record. So when the director of the FBI is interviewed, Mr. Perry, are you keeping a record of firearms transactions? Mr. Perry, before Congress, in official sworn testimony, can say, no, sir, we are not. But it doesn't mean that the government doesn't know who picked up that firearm. So I, I want to bring up both of, those, both of those parts. The first one you mentioned was the idea of you know, how, we, how we try to fix the problem afterwards. The surveillance state doesn't actually stop crime. The surveillance state just makes sure we, can, we have a better chance of punishing people who commit crimes. To make sure that's true. It, the surveillance state doesn't protect us, it allows us to be more vengeful. So we need to be clear on that. It allows us to be more vengeful. That does not protect us. But they always say we need the surveillance to protect us. That's actually not true. It doesn't protect us. They always find a way around it every single time, but instead we, we often can punish the people. But the worst part is, if we pick the wrong people, no one knows we did because we had this great surveillance state. So it wasn't you know, Osama bin Laden who did it, it was Saddam Hussein or insert person here. So that's a big problem. But your other point is a very valid one also about 9-11. And I'm guilty 100%. I was a Marine for seven years. I got out in 1993. When I got out, I thought, I'm done, it's over. When 9-11 hit that morning, I'm a New Yorker, I, w I watched the second tower go down. I remember wanting to re-enlist. I remember, literally wanting to call, I remember the number, 1-800-MARINES, because I wanted to go in as an officer and I wanted to go do something. I remember that emotion, remember that feeling. I didn't do it because my logic overcame my emotion. But my emotion was there. So your drumbeat, yes, it worked on me. I was there, I felt it. I felt the emotion, as I'm sure tens of thousands of young Americans did, and they joined up thinking they were doing something right, and they went off to Afghanistan or Iraq. But I, I get it, You're, I'm just, I'm reiterating you are correct. I felt the drum beat myself. Let us come back though, since the objective of this panel was end the surveillance state, to what we should do about it. Because if you go back to the late 90s, under one of our last five or six worthless presidents, there are a whole bunch of surveillance proposals like know your bank, know your customer, which got shot down. One of the, nor your customers specifically went, got shot down by the Libertarian Party because we started running full page ads in the New York Times attacking it and we asked for donations to support it and we got large amounts of money in. And the um, reptiles crawled back under their, rap, their rocks and stayed there for 10 years and if you look up the stuff that was being put, the corrupt stuff that was being pushed in the late 90s, it went away for a dozen years and then came up back after 9-11 because it was all there. Uh, there was, however, something else from the late 90s that did not come back. And what did not come back was our Libertarian National Committee and National Party doing public outreach attacking this sort of improper behavior. And we do not see the modern equivalent of the Libertarian Party and the surveillance state and know your customer. And that is a, fail a curable failing of our national committee, which I hope will get cured, and which will also take us into the next panel. What time is it, by the way? Uh, we have about uh, five minutes left. Okay, we have about five minutes. Angela, do you want to add to that, or shall I take another question? I was going to just add something to that I, that came into my mind. Um, for those of you who like to do a little research, if you look up William and Nancy Hamilton, they developed a software in the 80s called Promise. The Department of Justice stole it, and they, the Hamiltons sued the Department of Justice for many, many years. What this software did was it, it, it uh, basically accumulated every person's electric bill, um, how much energy you're using in the house, your credit card bill, and it was the earliest way of compiling. It was supposed to be used by the department, it was supposed to be used as a prosecutor tool, 
but it basically now accumulated enough information where you can easily pull up profiles or create a profile in your mind. The Department of Justice stole that <coughs> software and ended up on the open market and ended up that foreign countries had it and it also had back doors built into it. The surveillance state is a lot older than we realize. I mean, the computerized one, it goes back to at least, I mean, at least that early. Most of us have forgotten it now because it just seems like such an ancient time, but going back to that, this was well, this pattern or this idea or the way direction we're going at was going long before 9-11. We've been on this path a long time, and I do encourage people to kind of read some of that history, the, the technology aspects, and how the government literally you know, stole software to help it surveil people better. I say something that I, I say this often, I want to say it again. If we want to change this, it takes a lot of conversations. It's really what it does. It takes conversations with you and the people you know, your friends, your family, the people you hang out with. Do what Angela says, go have friends, go outside and talk to people. And when you do have these conversations, talk about these things and get them out there. If people just hear about it once, twice, three times, it'll break through. I mean, I look at myself. There was a time when I thought everything the government did was correct. When I was 18 in the Marine, I would have given my life because some colonel said so. I would have ordered men to their death because some captain told me to do so. That's what I would have done. What got me to stop? People talking to me, having conversations to realize that that was not the right answer. I wouldn't do it today, but then I would have. And there are lots of people who still feel that way. We have to talk to them, have conversations, and before you know it, they'll come our way. Question. Yeah, uh, comment actually. So yes, I work for an IT company. Um, one thing I want to point out is that there is a long supply chain to these types of resources, for example, the Utah Data Center. Lots of companies, their products go into making this, this structure. No, it won't you know, affect the kind of the larger desire, the larger themes, but you can always go and talk to these companies that are supplying you know, these, these products to um, defense contractors, et cetera, and make sure that, uh, you know, that not only your voice, but also stakeholders' voices are, and shareholder voices are, are known. Um, the second point I want to make is that there, are, there is movement within companies like that, um, you know, probably about 10 years ago with, you know, sustainability, transparency, um, openness, and, and talking to stakeholders about issues. You know, people, this is on the minds of a lot of companies, you know, large IT companies, and, you know, there are individuals such as myself which are trying to push, you know, privacy and, and security um, as being a, a high priority issue that companies need to look at and address. You know, not only so that our products are you know clean and that we're you know we're not you know developing anything that can be used in this type of environment, but also um, you know that that um, that you know we're looking down our supply chain to make sure that our products are are not counterfeited or that there's no backdoors put into products. So there's a lot of you know things that can be done along the supply chain that can help impact or at least raise awareness of of these issues. Uh, there is a variation on that which just came to mind. <clears throat> if you own stock in a company, you get this proxy notice every year to vote. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you can do, though you may have to round up enough shareholders with enough shares, it depends on the company bylaws, is to start inserting company bylaws. For example, a shareholder vote at AT&T ordering them to delete the beam splitters uh, and the argument is it exposes AT&T to litigation and therefore is a misuse of corporate property. And even if the board of directors vote, vote against it, which is interesting to do if the statement is that it um, endangers this company's financial health to some extent, is that it puts the issue before the public, in particular the part of the public that has a lot of money and gets interested in politics. Does anyone want to add to that, or shall we bring things to a close? I guess the answer is thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the session. The Libertarian State Leadership Alliance.